are praising you day and night when you come back. But for now, we sing to you because you are worthy of every song, of every breath that we breathe.
of your love, that love that gave everything for us. So now we come, we bow down at your feet, and we lay it all down. Every fear, every sadness, all our joy, we lay it before you because you are worthy. And as we have lifted up our hands and lifted the songs to you, we open our hearts to your word. We know that you have something special for us today as always, Lord. So we open our hearts. Speak to us. We love you, Jesus. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Woo. Welcome to Fervent. <laughs> Woo. If you are here for the first time, we want to see your hand. We want to say hi to you. And we want to make you feel welcome. So if you're here for the first time, we want to see who you are. Can you show your hand? Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to Fervent. Anybody else here for the first time? Okay, you may greet the person next to you and then take a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. We're so excited to have all of you with us here this morning. And a special good morning to our new guests. If you have your new visitor card, you can go ahead and fill that out and head over to the hub after service. And we have a new visitor bag as well as a free cup of coffee or a free soda if you want it. And we just want to get to know you and bless you through that. And if you didn't get a visitor card, you can still head over to the hub after service and you can uh, just let them know that it's your first time and they will give you and they'll take care of you. So we're going to start off with our announcements this morning. And we're going to be starting with our men's retreat, which is on October 7th through the 9th. And guys, you don't want to miss this. We're going to be uh, having three days of worship with God and, and time in the word and, of course, some fellowship with the men of the body. And I was there a couple months ago, and I never got bored. There was something to do every single second of the day. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there's paddle boarding. There's, I was throwing axes. Um, what else were we doing? Oh, and then the food. You don't want to miss the food either. I had so many chicken nuggets. I went over like 100 times. I had my whole sauce of barbecue sauce. So you, the food, you're not going to want to miss the food either. And it's just going to be a great time with the men of the body. So come and join us for our men's retreat. We're going to be at Camp Ironwood, which is two hours outside of Las Vegas. So come and join us on October 7th through the 9th. And you can go ahead and register today because there's only a few spots left. And young men 14 years and older are also invited, and you just need to be accompanied by someone who is an adult. And you guys don't want to miss this because I'm going to be there, so you definitely don't want to miss it. <laughs> and ladies, don't forget about the No Apologies Ladies Conference. And registration is open now, and it's happening on Friday, October 21st, and Saturday, October 22nd with Elisa Childers. You're not going to want to miss this event, ladies. Uh, so go ahead and do that, uh, register after service. And we're also inviting all the Calvary women in the valley. So it's also going to be a great time of fellowship with them as well. And lunch is included and snacks. And I'll also be there because I'm running sound. But <laughs> so I'll see you there. So don't miss that either. So go ahead and register online or at the... <laughs> And up next, uh, election season is coming up and early voting is almost here. So we have an opportunity for poll watchers. Faith Winds is focusing on recru recruiting only Christians as volunteers to do the work of poll watching. So who better to guard the integrity of our elections than us Christians? So if you're interested, please sign, uh, sign in now with this QR code on the screen. And you can also find Faith Winds literature in the lobby. And last but not least is our foster family date night. Our fostering ministry Anchored in Faith will be hosting a foster date night on Saturday, September 24th at 
It doesn't have a time. Oh, okay. So, yeah, look to the screen because I don't have it here. <laughs> and if you'd like to serve the foster families uh, in this way and just help them while mom and dad go on, on, on a date night, you can go ahead and sign up online and you can be here next Saturday at 4.45 p.m. They have that time, but they don't have the other time. So if you have foster, and then we also want to let the foster parents here know that if you have foster kids, we would like to uh, just bless you with this night. So you can also sign your kids up online as well. And if you have any further questions, please see Jenny Case in our children's ministry. And don't forget to sign, uh, scan the QR code that is up on the screen to access our news and events and our website because there's so many other things happening here at Fervent and we don't want you to miss it. And before uh, I get off the stage, uh, I'm going to introduce Jimmy from Olive Crest. I don't know if I can follow that energy. Um, and I think you're going to the no apologies for the snacks, just to be honest. Uh, my name is Jimmy Monahan. Um, I'm super emotional because a lot of people, a lot of familiar faces are here. So it's really good to see a lot of old family. Um, so forgive me if I get a little emotional. Um, Olive Crest, Jimmy Monahan, executive director. We're next door. 20 years ago, uh, my firstborn child was removed from my wife and I's custody because her and I were active drug addicts. Hard times, crazy season in our life. Somebody stepped up and took placement of my child and gave my wife and I a shot at getting well and becoming the parents that God had planned for us to be. There was a moment of hope that was whispered into my ear at a place a lot like Olive Crest called Savio House in Denver, Colorado, when everybody was trying to tell us that we could not raise this baby together, that we'd never make it together, that my wife should take the baby or I should take the baby because nobody can get sober together, let alone raise a child in out of active drug addiction. So this lady leaned over and she said, don't listen to him, you can do this. And it was the moment of hope that was whispered into my life that changed it forever. That's what we do over there. We prevent child abuse in three ways. We preserve the family first and foremost. The government was never meant to raise children. Families are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what we do over there is we try to keep families whole. We try to get them healthy. And we try to get those kids back to them before the government gets involved. Right? Right? the government does get involved, we are also a fully licensed foster care. We are faith-based. One of the things that we do is we go visit our families four times a month. A uh, story that you don't know is I'm also a foster parent. That shouldn't say foster date night. That should say foster parent nap night. <laughs> Trust me. Um, like I said, somebody poured into us at one point, so we poured into a family um, trying to help them get reunited with their kiddos. They unfortunately could not get their lives together, so I couldn't put a three-month-old, a three-year-old, and a six-year-old back into the system. So my wife and I ended up adopting them. So yeah, it gets a little more crazy, right? So because of this foster experience I had, it is so important for me over at Olive Crest to be involved with our families, to give them the support and the care that they need because fostering is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and I quit smoking crack. <laughs> that should tell you something, right? Pretty hard. Uh, it's also lonely and we, we really could use some help. The other piece that we do to prevent child abuse and neglect is 60% of the sex workers or foster care kids uh, coming out of foster care. 60 to 80% will be homeless in 18 months. Uh, drug addiction runs rampant and so does crime in the community because of that drug addiction. And we house 14 kiddos that are aging out of foster care to give them a shot at life that they wouldn't otherwise have. So that's our third prong of child abuse prevention. So we're going to invite you to be a champion, a friend, or a family. Champion's real easy. You can grab this card right here and sign up to be a monthly sustainer. Our goal is 1,000 people at $100 a month. That's $100,000 a month, that's $1.2 million I don't have to go raise because I don't want to be dependent on government money, right? Because I don't want to be told how to run my agency by the government. Somebody's happy about that. I'm happy about that. Or you can be a friend. A friend is being a care community, coming around a foster family a lot like ours and providing a pizza one Tuesday 
a week for a year. It's 12 pizzas. Well, in my house, it'd be like 40 pizzas because um, we have 10 children in my house right now uh, because we adopted another one in March. And just Friday, if I look tired and delirious, it's because I am. Uh, we took twin one-year-olds that are medically fragile and a two-year-old that's medically fragile into our home on Friday night. One of the kiddos went to the PICU, but we haven't slept in two days because they're in cribs right next to our bed and cough and they're really sick, but um, so I'm tired. We could use your help. The other piece is to be a family. There's 4,000 kids in child welfare in Las Vegas. There's 500 churches. That means eight kids a church. Do that. Eight. I have 10. Eight kids a church. We can eradicate the need for child welfare in Las Vegas by as a faith community stepping up and fostering these kids to get them back to their families whole and healthy. So my charge to you is everybody, right? If everybody can do something, what's your something? So pray on that, think about it. We're gonna be out in the lobby. We'd love to talk to you. And thank you so much, church, for your support, being incredible next door neighbors that you are. And to all my old friends, it is really good to see you again. Good morning once again. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor David, and I kind of took a break because I usually lead worship, but I was back there today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Medinas, these four, were my brothers. So this morning they, they got to lead worship. Hey, thank you. Yeah. They got to lead worship. And um, speaking about a lot of kids, our family is a family of 13 kids. And I'm the baby, and so growing up, I got to be led by my brothers, my brothers who are older than me, and we have a total of seven pastors in our family. And so, yeah, what a blessing, amen? And so this morning, I have the privilege of introducing Pastor Enrique to you, and he was my pastor uh, when I first started leading worship. It was like my fifth year into worship, and I was getting broken into it and a little nervous and did it with an acoustic guitar and here I go. And, and it, it, was, it was a great opportunity for me to grow. And, um, and I, I'm so appreciative for my family, for, for my brothers who are pastors. And this morning, I want to introduce to you, who's going to bring the word, Pastor Enrique Medina. Okay, we'll have a video. All right. No animals were harmed, okay? <laughs> but hey, who doesn't love a comeback? Who doesn't love a comeback? How many, how many, how many like comebacks? All right. Now, let me, let me, let me uh, read you some comebacks that uh, maybe you're aware of it, but I'm, I'm going to remind you, okay? Five years before publishing one of the most influential books of the 21st century, J.K., J.K. Rowling was living on welfare and struggling as a single mother. Rowling wrote the first book in the Harry Potter, Potter series while working during the night as a teacher. 
but the manuscript was rejected 12 times by publishers. When Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone eventually did get published, Rowling was advised not to quit her day job since her chances of success was very slim. And of course, with over four, 450 million Harry Potter books so, sold worldwide, we'll know how that really turned out. Amen. Before becoming one of the best players in the history of basketball, Michael Jordan was only 5'11". Aspiring high school sophomore rejected by his varsity team for being too short. But according to Jordan, failure is just a part of the eventual success. Take it from the man who led the Chicago Bulls to six NBA championships and won the most valuable player award five times. Quote, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. Jordan has said I have lost almost 300 games. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. The best soccer player in the world, Leo Messi, an Argentinian born. When he was 10, 12 years, he was gifted playing soccer. But then it was discovered that he was born with a growing condition. And the doctors t told his parents he wasn't going to grow more than four feet. Barcelona team from Spain took a chance on him. They took him to Spain. And they uh, gave him a treatment of, out of hormones. And he grew up to be, I don't know, 5'7", as tall as I am. <laughs> but he became the, the best soccer player in the world. Soccer player in the world. I mean, those are great comebacks, right? Great comebacks. Now, I, I thank the Lord that we are back. That after 2020, the pandemic, as a pastor, and I know Pastor Jimmy feels the same way, we lost some of our members to the pandemic. I remember when they told me to shut down my church, I didn't know what to do. But I always thought, okay, this, this is okay, I'm going to do it. But, but when one of my members died from COVID-19, that really hit home. That really hit home. And then we were relegated to just preach to a little camera and do our conferences through Zoom. No more people, no more church. And that was, that was shock, shocking to me. But today we are back, and the questions, the question that I, I want to present to you is, okay, we're back, but, uh, but why are we back? And to what are we coming back? Is how, and how are we going to get back? And if we're back, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to be doing the same things that we were doing all the time? Oh, God wanted to shake, shake it up so that, that we will see that he's coming back again. And we are the church that he has chosen. Okay? Now, we're going to go back to Jesus and the disciples. And the disciples of Jesus and Jesus are in the city of Philippi, of Caesarea, 150 miles north of Jerusalem. And it is there that Jesus asked, asked them a very important question and a very famous question. And he asked the disciples, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And Peter, remember Peter? The quiet one? No, not the quiet one. <laughs> okay, he goes up to Jesus. Uh, I, you know, I, I, can, I can picture that when, he, when Jesus asked the question, you know, uh, who do you think I am? And all the disciples took a step back. 
<laughs> and let, they left it. They left it in the front. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you guys. But then he gets this inspiration. He says, "Jesus, I think you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And Jesus, I think, he says, "Bingo, Peter, bingo." And if Jesus was a Mexican, he would have said, Loteria. <laughs> you, you got it, Peter. You got it. But then Jesus said, but this is not from you. The Holy Spirit, my Father, revealed it to you. Wow. And then Jesus makes, he declares something very important. And this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, found my teaching. And on this rock. I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And on this rock, okay, I'm not going to go into who's the rock, you know, Peter, the, you know, none, none of that. Uh, and on this rock, I will, build my I will build my church. Now, Jesus, this is the first time that the word church is introduced in the Bible. This is the first time. Because at, up to this time, no church. Mm -mm. Only the Hebrew people, right? But he, Jesus comes and says, I'm, I'm doing something new, something new. Now, we all are familiar with this word, right? Church, right? What is the church? People, building, right? Okay. But when they translated the word church, the first translation, the New Testament translation, out of the Greek, okay? When the translation of the New Testament was made, it was done in the Greek language and not in Aramaic, okay? The original is written in Greek, not in Aramaic, okay? Now, which was the language that Jesus spoke, okay? And Matthew when he wrote this, this word church, he chose the word ecclesia. Do we have the word there? Ecclesia. Okay? Ecclesia. Now, in Greek, ecclesia means assembly of people. Congregation of people. Gathering of people. And what Jesus said, he told the disciple, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something big. But not something big, something very, very big. Very big. And we thank God that we are still here after everything that happened in 2020. Okay? As I told you, we lost some of our members to the pandemic. Now, when Jesus asked the disciples... Who do you think I am? They say, they say it's Jesus. Now, okay. I'm back to my, to my notes. When Jesus says the word church, ecclesia, he's talking about people. Okay? Now, the next. Jesus never spoke of a place. Jesus never spoke of a place. Jesus, Jesus spoke about people. About people. Now, I remember when we were going through the pandemic... The church wasn't there. Yes, it was. The building was there. I remember I used to go to my church. It's your church also. And no people there. And it dawned on me. The church is not the building. The church is the people. You and I are part of this great idea that Jesus brought to us. The gathering of people. That is the church. That is the church. Now, let me tell you something very important, okay? In the following years, when they wrote the New Testament, okay, uh, when they translated the word, uh, the New Testament into German, they did, not, they did not use the word ecclesia. They used the word Church in Germany is church, church, churchy or kirky. 
I, I, I don't speak German. <laughs> I know I'm destroying the, 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 the language. So, and Kirky or Cherokee means church, building, house of God. And Jesus never sp spoke of a place. Never. As a matter of fact, when David wanted to build a, the temple to God, God never asked him to build a temple for him. Did you know that? Never asked him. But again, the Jews wanted to be like the other nations. Exactly what the Lord told them not to do, they did. They did. When you go into the promised land, do not do like the pagans. Do not follow the idols. Oh, they did. Oh, they did. Why do you want to build me a temple, David? Because all the other nations have temples. And the Lord told them, okay, David, I'm going to let you build me a temple. But let me tell you this. If you guys ever wander away from me, don't ever think that I'm going to be there. As long as you keep my commandments and you follow me, I'm going to be there in the temple. But if you don't follow me, I'm not going to be there. Because God never, never intended the church to be a building, a structure. God always spoke about people. That, that's why it's very important the word ecclesia, assembly of people. He never spoke of a place. Jesus spoke of a comeback, of a comeback, okay? Now, when Jesus was arrested, beaten, crucified by the Roman soldiers, the disciples got very discouraged, right? They went home because Jesus had died, because Jesus had died. They ran away. Peter denied his master. They were all sad. But what made the difference in the disciples' life is that Jesus rose again. That's what made the difference. Because he fulfilled what he promised. He told them, hey, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to be resurrected in the third day. And he did. And he did. And they walked and they ate with their master for 40 days. Now everything changed. Because he, Jesus, made the great comeback. Amen? Come on, give me an amen. All right. Let's give him a round of applause. Okay, now, now. Let me tell you, let me tell you why this is important. Okay, the application to you and me. Because none of the religious leaders have raised again. None. None. Muhammad. It's two, three, four, five feet under the ground. Okay? Gandhi died. Mahoma died. Confucius died. Buddha died. And somehow these, these teachers, these teachings, they have kept them alive. And we see them all over the place. We see them all over the place. But with the disciples, it was different because they, cha, they saw Jesus resurrected, right? Okay, now. Okay. But before Jesus left, he gives him a commandment. And we find that in Matthew 28, 19. What we know as the great commandment, right? Therefore, after I go... After you receive the power, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And I assure you, I will be with you until the end of the world. Okay? So, Jesus told them, I want you to go to all peoples and nations. And I want you to make followers of Jesus in all nations. And I assure you that I will be with you until the end of the world. But then, I'm pretty sure Peter and all this point, there he goes again. There he goes again with this, I mean, asking for us. He, he, you guys, he goes going to all the world. 
At, the, at those times, they were not planes. They were not cars. They, they were like, how are we going to do this? There he goes again, asking us for something that we cannot do. Remember the small, uh, the, uh, the two fishes and five small loaves? Remember that? And we told him, give him, give him, you feed them. <laughs> Come on, Lord. Now he's asking us to go all over the world. We're never going to do that. We're never going to do that, okay? Now, if we, as a church, the ecclesia, not the building, okay? We established that. Are going to be back. Are going to come back. The comeback, the return must be different. It must be different. We must leave our comfort. We must go out and preach that Jesus crucified and risen. That Jesus was crucified and risen. And, risen. and this is what makes the difference for the disciples. This is what made the difference. Because they told the, Jew, the Jews, the people, you guys killed him. He preached. He came to save you. You guys killed him. You guys killed him. But he's alive. And that's what made the difference. And what happened? The church, the church grew from 3,000 and then 5,000 and then a lot of people. But only in Jerusalem. Only in Jerusalem. And I imagine, okay, this is, this is me, okay? <laughs> My mind goes wild with this. Because I imagine the father talking to the son, okay? And the father tells the son, son, the church stopped growing. What's going on? What's going on? God tells Jesus, son, the church is not moving. God tells Jesus, those you left in charge, they did not understand the commission to go to all the, over the world. They stay in their village. They didn't go out. As Jesus told them to do. And God the Father tells his son, we have to, we're going to have to do something about it. We're going to have to, you know, to, to get him stirred, to, to, to move, to move up, to move, to move up. And the Father, and Jesus said, you know what, Dad? I think we need, we need a leader. We need someone, you know, to, to, uh, to move the, the, the pot, to remove the pot. And, and, and we need somebody to, to, go, to go out. To go out. Uh, and, and Jesus tells the, the Father, I think you, choose, you, you need to choose someone else. You need a leader who dares to leave Jerusalem, get on a ship, a ship who speaks more than one language, who, who is a Roman citizen, and to make it more interesting, who is a Pharisee and recruit, recruit him. Okay. Jesus told the Father, we need somebody that you know, can do all this. Oh, and the father said, you know, good idea, son. Now, this is not in the Bible, okay? This is me, remember. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Jimmy, my brother Enrique started teaching. You know. No, this is my story, okay? This is what I think it happened. So God the Father comes with this great idea. And God the Father said, yes, yes. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. There's one that's going, that's a, he's on his way to Damascus. You know what I'm talking about? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> Jesus goes, no, they, no, they're not that one. <laughs> no, why not? He's a Pharisee. He speaks more language, more than five languages. He's a Roman citizen. I mean, he's got all the connections. <laughs> there. Did you know that he's killing Christians? <laughs> oh, yes, I know that. But you're going to take care of him. Acts chapter 9, if you, if you want to find out what Jesus did. Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he told him, hey, we need you. We need you. We need, we need a man that can take the gospel to all the world. All right? <clears throat> all right. And, then, and then, okay, okay. So, but Paul of Tarsus represents a big problem for agnostics, those who don't believe, for those who say that they cannot trust the New Testament. Look what he did. 
Paul, the Apostle Paul, went to Jerusalem and said, hey, hey, guys. After he got converted, he became a Christian. Okay, Hey, guys, we're stuck in Jerusalem. We need to move out. We have to move. This movement is stagnant. It's frozen. We need to go out. We have to grow this movement. Because I found out that it's not only for the Jews. It's for all the people. It's for all the world to see. And Paul spent the last 30 years of his life preaching the gospel and establishing churches all over all over the world to that point known. But this is what it's interesting. He was beaten. He was arrested. He was chased out. Uh, he was chased out from the cities for over 30 years of his life. He suffered a lot. Every, everywhere he went, Paul had the same message. Jesus did something very big. He rose from the dead. And that was a proof to authenticate and confirm everything he said. Remember when he went to Athens? They had all kinds of idols, all kinds of gods. Oh, my God. And then... He found a little niche altar that said, to the unknown God. <laughs> I said, okay. And then everybody came to hear Paul. And he said, to this God, this is the God you guys need. And he preached the same thing. He came, he gave us hope, he died, and he rose again. That's it. Same message. And the church grew and grew and grew now, at the end of his life, Paul was arrested and taken to Rome when Nero was the emperor, right? A little bit of history right here. Paul was in prison and wondered. Remember, Paul was in prison and wondered, was it worth it? Was it worth it? All the pain, all the suffering, and many times. The Spirit of the Lord came to Paul and said, Paul, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. I, I'm pretty sure Paul was asking himself, was this worth it? Uh, did this work after all? All that ecclesia thing, all that, did this work? Or we were delusional in believing in thinking that the ecclesia was going to survive the Roman Empire. I mean, it looked very blimped. And sometimes, I think, we should ask ourselves, is this worth it? Is my church worth it? Is this worth it? Or am I willing to pay the price? Or we just close our churches and go bye-bye. You know, that was a big, a big fight in my soul. Because I understood that we were going to be the generation, either those who hid themselves and went away, or those who said, this is very important, we're not going to close. And let me tell you, let me tell you, when I was in California and heard about your pastor that he did not want to close the church, it takes a man of God to do that in the middle. I was, was going to be political correct. Oh, yeah. And many of my mentors and many of the big churches, big churches, mega churches, oh, man, what they did, they just closed and they ran away. Because it was political co correct. Uh, I, I, did, did we ask the Lord, church, Lord, what do you want us to do? Oh, no, no, what the government says. We're just going to bow down. We're just going to bow down. Is it, is it worth it? Is it worth it? You know, uh, 
are we going to survive? Are we going to come back? Are we going to do that great comeback like Jesus did, like Leo Messi did, like Michael Jordan did? You know what? Roman, a culture that worshiped Mars, Jupiter, Zeus, that from such a small city with a handful of men who were going to impact the world as he told us. And Paul was thinking, here I am in jail, in jail waiting to be executed. Paul did not come out from prison. He didn't see the day of light. And he was admonished by the Holy Spirit that if he was going to Rome, he was going to be in prison. prison. Remember that? He said, hey, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a man of God. Wow. But Paul must be thinking, here I am in jail waiting to be executed. But you know what? If he had been there, but if we, if we had been there with Paul, and when Paul was led away by the Romans, Roman soldiers to be executed, if we could tell Paul, Paul, don't be discouraged. If we could go back there and tell him, Paul, it did work. It did work, Paul. The gospel worked. You know, Paul, the city that you were executed. Paul, the gospel work, the city that you were executed today is one of the most religious cities in the world. Nowadays, there are crosses all over the place. There are chapels, temples all over the place in Roman, right? In Roma. Now the cross, it, it no longer means death. It means life. Life. Whenever you see a cross, you see hope. Hope is not, it's not, it doesn't mean death anymore. Paul, it was worth it, Paul. I wish you could be here, Paul. I wish you could be here. But if we were there, we could tell Paul, it was worth it, Paul. It was worth it, okay? Uh, the Roman Empire, Paul, the Roman Empire, Paul, it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. No longer exists. And when people arrive in Rome, they don't ask about Caesar Augustus. They don't ask about Nero. You know who they ask for? They want to go to Paul's, Paul's place when he was in prison. People all over the world want to go to a place, the place that you die. Paul, you're famous now. <laughs> you're famous. You know what, Paul? Nowadays, people name their kids Peter, Andrew, James, and Paul. And now, today, the people name their dogs Neron. <laughs> isn't, isn't God awesome? Isn't God uh, I mean, wow. And you know what, Paul? Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they no longer uh, ask for Sister Augustus. All those letters that you grow, wrote, reach their destination. And not only that, your letters, Paul, are read all over the Christian world and were translated into more than 1,200 languages. Today, parents name their children Pedro, Andres, Juan, and yes, Pablo. I already said that in English, but I'm, I'm just saying Spanish. Okay, now, now, today, more than a third of the world's population affirms, confirms some kind of faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that a, talk about a comeback. In reality, it is a story that you and I, we are responsible for shaping. You know what? We are continuing the Acts, the book of Acts. We are the church. We are the church. Whether we like it or not, whether you like it or not. But more than that, we are responsible 
listen to this, we are responsible for what will come to mind to this generation and the next when they hear the word church. We are responsible. You and I are responsible. You and I are the ecclesia, the people of God. All this happened because Jesus said it. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is saying nothing and no one is going to stop the ecclesia because my spirit is going to be in their midst. <laughs> wow. God calls you, calls you, you, and you to be a part of what God is doing in the world through his church. You know, it blows my mind. In Sunday morning, did you know, or do you know what is the biggest event in the world Sunday morning? Not the World Soccer, Soccer Cup, not the uh, Super Bowl. You know what is the biggest event? Sunday morning church. Can you give him more of a prize, okay? Now, why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? You know, you know what? Only in this church, okay? How many people are, are here? 400, 500, okay? The lights, the sound, all that we do. Now, multiply that for, I don't know, a million times. I mean, it is the biggest concert. It is the biggest worship event Sunday morning. We have power. We have the power. We are the ecclesia. We are the ecclesia. And this is awesome when we think about this in Mexico, Brazil, Spain, uh, 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 the United States, uh, uh, Great Britain. They, uh, we, right now, it is an awesome concert of the biggest event in the world. It takes millions and millions of dollars to promote this. There is no concert that comes even close to this. Because <laughs> you're part of something great and something big. You know, the church is not something that Pastor Jim and I or, or some pastor got together. Ah, okay. What are we going to do next year? Well, you know, let's buy, a, let's buy a building and let's call this church. Ah, no. No. This is something very Big, and we can make an impact uh, in the in the world. Okay, now, and God calls you, calls you and you to be part of what God is doing through the world, to, the, to his through his church. The question, and I want to leave you with this question, and I want to ask you, and I and, and I want you to meditate on these questions today. I don't know, maybe in your small group, maybe in your house. What is my next step? What is my next step? What is my next step? For someone, for someone, your next, pe your, your next step is going to be growing in the Lord. You're growing in the Lord. That's going to be your next step. For others, will be to begin your relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? That, that, that needs to be your next step. Perhaps something happened in your life. Perhaps your next step will be get baptized and become a member of the great church, the ecclesia. For others, maybe will be your next step. Your next step will be to start serving. Serving. Be Serve in a ministry. To start serving in a ministry. For others may be starting to give financially. Uh, okay, okay, we skip that one. <laughs> no, no. Okay, maybe that, that, that's your next step. Okay? To start giving financially. You know, if you are part of the church, get with it. Get with it. By the way, you guys have awesome facilities. Awesome facilities. And, 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 uh, and I commend you for that. Because you guys made everything possible. It is possible. Have the kind of worship that you guys have. Because I've been here. I mean, all, all of this. Be part of the church. Start a ministry. 
Uh, bring your family. Uh, start serving. Uh, you know, it, 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 you don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be a, 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 a singer. Just become part of the, of the ecclesia, okay? Now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it with this, and I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come up. Put, put the, the last, the, last um, the church, let me tell you why this is important, that you take your, your next step. Because the church must be much more than any other organization, simply because what we do is, is much more important because people's eternity is in the balance. Did you hear that? Now soak that in. Soak it in. The church is the hope of the world because the, me the message that God gave us, that God gave his church, has the power to change lives. No other organization has this power. Not even Google. Not even Microsoft. You and I, we have the power to change lives. The church is the hope of the world because the, me the message that God gave his church has the power to change lives. The church must be much more determined than any other organization, simp simply because what we do is much more important. People's eternity is on the balance. It's on the, it's soak it in. That tonight, you might, you might not sleep well thinking about this. I'm giving, uh, uh, in my church, I'm giving a service on, on the end times. And the theme that comes back and comes back and comes back that we are going to heaven, right? And the question is, why God hasn't come yet? Because he's patient. He's waiting for you and I to go out and talk about Jesus. Jesus wants to take to heaven a lot of people, millions of people. There's still a lot of people that don't know Jesus Christ. You and I have been called to carry this message to all the corners of the earth. But it becomes personal to you and me. What is my next step? What is my next step? Whether that step is, whatever that step, step is, just take it. Take it. Take it. I don't know where you are right now in your relationship with God. But whatever step you need to take, take it. Let me tell you, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Never regret it. Because the favor, the blessings of the Lord is going to be in your life. This could be your starting point. You need to restart. We need to restart. I, I, I believe God gave us another opportunity. Let's not miss it, guys. Let's not miss it. God is very close. In a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be gone. And I don't want you, I don't want you when you get to heaven, and when you see your father, And you get there and say, why didn't I pray more? Why didn't I read the Bible more? Why didn't I go to church more? Why didn't I share the word with my family? They would have been here with me. I don't want you to regret it. I want you that your father, heavenly father, will say, hey, come in. Come in. Let's rejoice together because you've done you've done." Very well, indeed, my servant. Let's all stand.
Let's all stand. Consider this morning what God can do in your life and through your life. And through your life. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. If you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just raise up your hand. I want to see the hands for the first time. For the first time. Maybe you need to recommit your life to the Lord and say, I need, a, I, I need to start again. I need a new starting point. I need, I need a starting point. Raise up your hand. You need to come back to the Lord. You need to reconcile with the Lord. What is your next step? What is your next step? As we sing together this last song, I want you to worship with us. What they worth? What? Yeah. 
Church, have a great day. God bless. We'll see you tonight. Thank you. God bless.